Good morning, and on behalf of HL7 and NCQA, welcome to day two of the Digital Quality Summit. I'm Michael Barr, Executive Vice President, Quality Measurement and Research at NCQA. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's sessions. Now, recordings for all sessions, other than the conversation with ZDog, were already posted to the Whova app. You can access them through the agenda. Slides are being added and will be at the bottom of the same page, and recordings will be available to you for six months. I'm also told that the Whova app community section is quite active. Travel hopes, quarantine activities, everything from digital quality measures to dog lovers of DQS. It's really great to see people engaging in this new virtual environment. We have a great agenda today, which includes an opening general session, followed by concurrent working sessions from 11.45 to 1.10 p.m. Eastern time, followed by a 20 minute break from 1.10 to 1.30. After the break, we have the Paper Killers Roundtable at 1.30, and then additional working sessions from 2.15 to 3.30. At 3.30, we will reconvene for two additional general sessions including Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, Eric Hargan, speaking about the National Health Quality Roadmap. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors for the Digital Quality Summit, especially Merck, our underwriter sponsor, and Pfizer, our presenting sponsor. Please visit the exhibitors during the break today. Now, don't forget, for technical help, you can go to the support tab under the main navigation on the Whova app. Please tweet hashtag DQS2020. Join the new digital measurement community, digitalcommunity.ncqa.org, complete your session surveys, and then, of course, at the end, the overall evaluation of the meeting after it concludes. Okay, our first speaker is Danielle Brooks, Director, Health Equity, AmeriHealth Caritas. Danielle has spent the last decade designing, leading, and managing research, project development, strategy, and implementation programs across a variety of industries, including healthcare, but also media and communications, human rights, policy, and law. She is a recognized thought leader and expert in the field of health equity. And I've known Danielle as a colleague and friend for about 10 years since her days at the eHealth Initiative, when she expertly managed an ACO council and kept one of the co-chairs that would be me in line. The, the title of Danielle's talk is Beyond Data Collection, the ROI on Health Equity and Quality Improvement. And it's a, such a critically important topic these days. So remember to please enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A box because Danielle will be taking questions. Danielle, over to you. Welcome to the Digital Quality Summit. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barr, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, I truly appreciate the opportunity to be here um, and to share some of my thoughts around this important subject. Um, I will be sharing my screen momentarily to show my slides. I hope you all are able to see them. Um, and as Dr. Barr uh, introduced me, I will be speaking about the ROI um, <clears throat> on health equity and quality improvement. Um, currently, I am the Director of Health Equity for Mayor Health Caritas, a managed care organization that uh, serves several states in the District of Columbia. And in my role, um, I'm really responsible for all things health equity, um, improving health equity for our members, our associates, our providers, and external stakeholders alike. Now, before I uh, get into my uh, main comments, I am um, required to say that these statements that I'm making are my own and are not the views of my employer. But I have included my uh, contact information at the end of the slide deck, and I'm happy to take additional questions after the presentation and connect with people who would like to learn more about the subject and the work that I'm doing and our organization is doing. So before I get into the broad piece of my presentation, I thought it was very important to really set a foundation with some key definitions, just so that we're all on the same page and that um, all of the audience knows what I'm speaking about when I'm using certain terms and, and phrases. So when I'm speaking about quality improvement, I am truly breaking it down to the simplest form possible. Um, really talking about that framework that is used to systematically improve the way the care is delivered to patients. Um, I've chosen the ARC definition just for the simplicity, but when I'm talking about that, that really is the actions, whether it be traditional quality improvement from an organizational standpoint, or digital quality improvement, or other types of activities, really that framework that is used to improve that care for all of the patients. 
Now, although I've titled this as a simplified definition, I think a better uh, phrase for this state or this slide would be um, a breakdown of the definition. So when I look to a quality improvement intervention um, and the way that care is delivered to patients, I'm really looking at the way that that improvement is done in a manner that can be measured, analyzed, and improved. So we're really looking at opportunities for this engagement that is measurable, analytical, and that we can improve upon the efforts that we put into place. Um, also, achieving true QI does require the commitment from all members of the organization, from the C-suite and the governance on down, to be on board to make a true quality initiative um, important and, and successful, rather. Now, health disparity. Um, I really thought that it was important to also level set this definition, and I chose to take this definition from Healthy People 2020 because it's one of the most widely used definitions, and it is a lot. It's a lot to assess through. But essentially what a health disparity is, is the difference between, from a demographic population health standpoint, um, the level of health, the achievement of health, um, the conditions that are experienced disproportionately from one population um, versus another. So that can be measured by race, ethnicity, language, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability status, immigration status, socioeconomic status, but really it is categorizing groups of individuals or populations and measuring the health achievement between those. Now, one of the things that I will describe with this health disparity is that oftentimes when people are looking at health disparities, there is a lack of recognition of the intersectionality of how some of these um, demographic standpoints influence. So typically when uh, an organization measures a health disparity, it's looked at as a very linear piece, a categorization and a health condition. And as you guys work within your respective work and organizations, I encourage the thought pattern to also include the intersectionality of components that also influence that disparity, whether that be geographic, location, age, um, other mechanisms to kind of really understand what that community overall faces. However, in space of that, in recognition that there are all of these intersectional components that do impact health disparities, we can say um, from an evidence-based standpoint, certain demographic groups face health disparities despite any intersectionality of support. One of the biggest examples that I can point to is the rate of maternal health disparities in the African-American community. Now, this particular um, health disparity has gained a lot of national spotlight over the past couple of years because regardless of your age, regardless of your economic achievement, and regardless of your education level, if you're an African-American woman of maternal age, um, you are more likely to die or have adverse um, health care complications for yourself and your child, um, regardless of any of these intersectional data points. Um, and for the African American population, as well as the indigenous population, death rates and complications are around three to four times that of um, white and Caucasian populations. One of the biggest examples that we can point to in this space is the health disparities faced by Beyonce and Serena Williams, two queens on their own, two individuals that have more money than I can count, um, still had adverse effects from their pregnancy similar to the general population. And it is a disparity as they are African-American women that face this particular maternal mortality. So again, when we think about disparities, it is very important to understand how this affects communities agnostically of intersectionality of data, but also including those points for further information. Now, the last definition that I really wanna go through is health equity. So typically the way that health equity is described in a, one of the most common uses of the health equity um, uh, definition is from the WHO, the World Health Organization, and it is again a mouthful. But essentially health equity is the process of removing these barriers, whether systemic or um, present or current or however you want to define them, so that despite your demographic information, despite where you may live, there is an equitable opportunity to gain and achieve health care. Um, and so what that really means is understanding the communities in which you serve, understanding those barriers and work um, assertively and with purpose to remove those barriers in order to allow individuals to achieve health equity, um, regardless of their demographic profile. 
So with these definitions kind of set, um, I really wanted to kind of level set and think through um, and hopefully inspire your organizations and your work to really think about how health equity can be implemented in a quality um, space. So one of the biggest ways that we can achieve health equity um, is to make it a measurable component to all QI activities. In my experience, health equity is sort of a rider. So people will either do the work and understand on the back end that there was a health equity issue, or maybe during an intervention, they recognize that through data, there's a health equity issue, there's disparities that are being faced by certain populations, but it's not always a principle up front. And so um, in order to make quality initiatives really equitable, but also successful, health equity has to be a principle that it's embedded up front at the beginning of any and all quality initiatives. Um, in addition to that, we have to really take a look at our communities. Who are we serving? What is the diversity of the communities? And what are their needs? So that means that we have to begin to have the conversations and ensure that we are being responsive to all the cultural and linguistic experiences of the members or the patients that we're serving. And this, again, is a principle that should be placed in the forefront of all activities. Um, another piece that is very important to achieving health equity is really understanding the systemic barriers that are being faced and to optimize the conditions where your patient and member communities are, where they are at this time. So where they work, where they've been born, where they live, where they grow, where they play, where they age, really understand what that population is facing and how we can optimize those conditions for the best health. We also have to make sure that all factors, including social determinants of health, um, employment, housing, education, access to care, food, all of these things and these systems are also built up and in support of any QI activities. Um, evidence shows that marginalized communities and communities of color disproportionately lack the resources for SDOH, which, which have a direct impact to any type of quality improvement initiative. So that also needs to be assessed and where it can be addressed, those mechanisms need to be improved. And finally, um, one of the most pressing pieces and often one of the most uncomfortable pieces to really bring forward is we have to, as a healthcare industry, start naming racism and discrimination, both historic and present, that impact the way that quality initiatives or any health activities are um, thought up and delivered. Uh, it's uncomfortable to hold with, but we do know that these systemic barriers have been systemic. And I'll discuss that a little bit later in my presentation, but it's really, all right. Sorry. Sorry guys, it looks like we had a little bit of technical difficulties, but I'm back um, and thank you for holding tight um, with us. Um, as I left off speaking about was just the NCQA distinction in multicultural healthcare. And um, just specifically uh, describing how it looks at um, really kind of identifying organizations that are setting themselves apart by providing quality of care that are culturally and linguistically responsive. So the two part uh, aim, <coughs> excuse me. Um, with that said, um, it really is recognizing that organizations and patients do better, quality metrics are better when it is responsible, the organization is responsive for the racial, cultural, and linguistic differences or diversity of their population. And the NCQA distinction in multicultural healthcare really works to identify organizations that are health plans, uh, managed care organizations, managed behavior health organizations, and wellness and population health organizations um, that lead the market in this response to providing culturally and linguistically service, uh, sensitive responsive services to reduce uh, healthcare disparities. So there's really five principal standards, um, and, I, and I will go through this quite quickly, but uh, these standards are really the anchors to the distinction and how NCQI assesses whether or not an organization has uh, met the metrics and the mark of attaining um, a uh, leading stance. So the first one is very important and should be embedded in every single quality initiative that um, any organization or system is undertaking. But you have to understand your population and the best way to do that is through data. So the first standard really looks at the capturing of race, ethnicity, and language data in a comprehensive way, in a complete way, and using that data in a way to measure the disparities and address them from a systematic way. The second uh, standard really looks at the access availability, availability, and I would also say the accuracy 
of language services. So really measuring the access to those language services. Are they available for the provider, for the patient, as well as how well are they to assess their accuracy of that? And so that is the second standard that really looks at um, uh, the MHC process. The third process is making sure that the practitioner network, your providers, those folks that you contract with and actually delivering the care are doing so in a culturally responsive way. So that's measured through looking at, does the provider have adequate language services? Are folks able to get language in the preferred, um, uh, their preferred language when they are in the provider's office? Does the provider speak a language that is not English, but is matching their patient population or perhaps a staff member? Or, and also, um, are the providers really kind of taking an opportunity to keep learning and understanding their populations, their cultural responsive training? Um, the fourth piece really looks at the actual services provided by the organization, which they call class services culturally and linguistically appropriate services, which are based on the 14 national class standard from the Office of Minority of Health, and really looks at the programs at the actual organization and how they are um, making sure that these uh, services are appropriately used across the spectrum of the organization. And finally, the fifth uh, standard really looks at what are the actions that are taken by the organization to reduce health disparities? Are they measurable? Can you analyze it? And can you improve upon it? Again, coming back to the initial uh, QI principles discussed earlier in this presentation. If you were to kind of lay the MHC principles um, over a quality improvement initiative, you can see how they directly influence and impact how health equity can be achieved through that initiative. Again, with the gathering of data, the availability of the linguistic services, making sure that your practitioner network is responsive, making sure you have programs in place, and are you looking to use all of these kind of mechanisms to actually reduce healthcare disparities? And so as you think about your QI initiative, I would encourage you to use the MHC distinction as a foundational opportunity to assess, are you actually meeting the mark in at least attempting to put QI, uh, sorry, health equity in the forefront of your quality initiative? Now, not to be too hard on NCQA, but there are several limitations to the actual MHC distinction. Um, as I said before, it sets a very nice foundation, a very good stake in the ground for understanding the population and providing some equity principles in order to address disparities. But it's kind of limited. And so what it doesn't do, it doesn't address the full integration of health equity principles into all of the QI initiatives. What that means is that it can be a very siloed approach of saying, for this very specific QI initiative, we are going to look at health equity principles but it doesn't really look at how that may impact other pieces, other comorbidities, other actions, other things that are going on with the population. There's a very siloed component to look at in this. It also doesn't really address systemic issues that underline health disparities. So as I described before, uh, discrimination, racism, historical inequities um, really do underpin some of the reasons why we continue to see um, disparities proliferate in the communities. Um, and it really doesn't have an opportunity to look at those systemic barriers and look at how they proliferate inside of an organization as well as externally and how that can be addressed as a mechanism. It's sort of a right here, right now, what are you going to do? Um, it also doesn't address really the intersectionality of communities um, in a complete way. So as I described before, you know, there are the opportunities to look at that siloed way of looking at a health disparity but there are other things to consider. So if I took myself as an example, I am an African-American woman, I'm from the Midwest, um, et cetera, so forth. In a QI initiative, you can only look, you can perhaps look at only kind of one dimension and it doesn't really address how are you taking those other data points and making sure that a disparity is looked at in a roundabout way. And finally, it really does kind of look at race, ethnicity, and language um, as really the core components of how health equity is measured um, and how multicultural healthcare is delivered. But it doesn't really talk about other factors that have a significant influence on health disparities, like sexual orientation and gender identity, or your immigration status, or other demographic categories that we know face disproportionate disparities. And so, while again, it's a strong foundation, I think there are some rooms to kind of 
um, really take that and lay it on top of what works for your organization by including a more holistic view of how disparities should be um, looked at to attack and reduce. So taking everything that I've stated, uh, I wanted to place sort of this conversation in the moment and really talk about health disparities with the impact of COVID-19 and also how certain populations are really being disproportionately impacted with disproportionate rates of, um, of, of, uh, of death as well as um, getting the disease itself. So Anthony Fauci, um, during one of the monthly uh, task force meetings that occurred this spring, really said something that shocked the health equity community. He recognized that, yeah, um, COVID-19 is shining a light on um, unacceptable practices that actually have perpetuated disparities that are known. Um, and so he really kind of took a stance and said, yeah, it makes sense that these disparities are happening because we know a lot of these underlying conditions continue to impact communities disproportionately. And that is also a rationale as to why uh, COVID-19 has a disproportionate impact on communities of color. So a couple of data points of this piece, um, pulling from the um, an NPR article released in May, um, you know, nationally African-American deaths have really been the spotlight in the disproportionality of impact of COVID-19. Um, they're nearly two times greater than would be expected based on the share of the population. Um, and in some states, four times greater, I'm sorry, three or four times, three or more times greater um, to contract and die from the virus. Um, this also impacts Hispanics and Latinx community members as they make up a greater share of confirmed cases as in proportion to their population. And when we look at this compared to white deaths, um, overall, white deaths are lower in comparison to African American, Latinx, and also indigenous populations. And so what we're really seeing is not only a disproportionate rate of contracting COVID, but a disproportionate rate of the most adverse effects and death um, as the pandemic has un unfolded. Now, there are complex factors as to why this is occurring, um, but it's again important to name the structural underpinnings of why this is impacting certain racial categories more disproportionately. Um, if you look at the data and some of the rationale behind this, um, when we look at African American, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous populations, there's a higher rate of cardiovascular diseases and chronic conditions that make um, the virus and the adver adverse effects from the virus more deadly um, and worse. And these are often pointed back to structural inequities as to why um, these populations suffer these chronic conditions at a higher rate. There's also an occupational vulnerability. So disproportionate, disproportionately members of this population also are in occupations that are more frontline, um, more workers that require um, sort of the underpinnings of either delivery services or working in factories, which has also created a disproportionate um, contraction of disease. In addition to that, however, when we look at systemic issues, there's a lack of adequate testing in populations of color. Um, treatment has shown to have biased effects. So when the disease first started in our shores, um, they didn't often meet the criteria for uh, getting a test and also timely results. And so we have sort of this backlog of how we assume the disease was spread when it was really kind of impacting these communities greatly. And based on treatment recommendations, that was slow to catch up. Um, in addition, when we look at the social terms of health from a disproportionate standpoint, populations of color are often lack of access to medical treatment. So lacking of primary care, or accessible primary care, um, quality of their health insurance, the housing, are they living in crowded housing or substandard housing? Do they have access to healthy food? And even in some instances, clean water all impact this. And if we think about it again, talking about the systemic reasons that have proliferated, this is why um, the COVID has been so disproportionately impactful to these communities. Now, I want to take you guys back a little bit because as we're speaking about data and the impact of COVID and thinking about it from a quality initiative, I promise I'll pull these strings together. One of the things we've heard so much was like, we need to get this data. We need to make sure that this data has demographic data tied to it. We need to understand more about why these chronic conditions occur. 
And I'm here to argue that actually these chronic conditions are not something that are new to the healthcare community in any shape of the word. In fact, we've known about the same proliferation of health inequities for, for a very long time. So I'm gonna take you back on a little story because it all kind of comes full circle. So in 1899, W.D. Du Bois, um, in a publication called The Philadelphia Negro, actually did a statistical analysis of the death rate um, for children. And they showed that African-American children were more likely to die um, under five when compared to white children. So that was the first known historical statistical standpoint. And there have been several others. Fifteen years later, uh, Booker T. Washington talked about the state of health care in the South, the disproportionate um, rate of catching diseases because of lack of sanitation and also death in children. Um, and these studies continue to roll out. In 1964, the Medical Committee for Health Rights called for the end of discrimination in hospitals. So they were calling for the disproportionate impact of health care um, or inequities in health care because of the discrimination faced in the health system. And we know today that that still proliferates. Um, and then in Again, in the 60s, 1964-65, Martin Luther King put a piece of uh, his platform about health equity, um, specifically talking about the rate of mortality and poverty in the African-American community, and was actually part of his platform. And so I'm stating these historical facts because from 1899, there has been a record of disproportionate health impacts for communities of color that it continues to proliferate and are also still underpinning why COVID has been so deadly for certain communities. 1979, um, Healthy People 1979 really kind of took a look at the rates of stroke and early stroke. We also took a look at the look at the live births um, as well as prenatal care and mortality rate and stroke deaths. And again, if we bump it against data from today, these statistics remain pretty solid. There hasn't been a lot of move in the needle. And this is 1979. 1985. Um, there was the Black and Minority Health Report and the task force um, out of uh, HHS, which also talked about um, the disparities that exist in healthcare conditions between African Americans and the white populace, and also the excess in death. So again, the drum is being beaten. We knew that these chronic conditions existed nearly 35 years ago. And then in 2020, one of the biggest cites, uh, citations that the health industry cites is the unequal treatment study by IOM. And really, again, kind of talked about um, how ethnic and racial minority communities receive lower quality of care, access to care, um, and also a range of other barriers um, that include the social determinants of health that have a negative impact on the way the quality of care is being delivered. So I took you on a journey from 1899 so 20, 2002, and again, the same consistent issues have been known. And so as we look at this, this, this pandemic that's kind of um, been pushed out, and we see the disparities, it makes sense that this occurs, but we also knew that they were there. Um, and so as I said before, the infant mortality rate still remains high, um, still a unacceptable amount of stroke in certain communities, and still a certain um, unacceptable amount of diagnoses of diabetes in certain communities. So it begs the question as we look at our systems and we look at our quality interventions and the opportunities to improve healthcare from an equitable standpoint, when I say we have to look at systemic barriers, organizations in the industry as a whole need to say, well, what is really going on from a systemic level that these barriers have continued to proliferate and now we have something like pen, uh, this pandemic that really blows the curtain out what can we begin to do to actually talk through that and answer those questions in a really um, specific way? So again, as we look at these national disparities, the history of disparities, um, and we point to some of the underlying conditions, again, as I emphasize, you see why um, certain communities have been impacted disproportionately um, because these disparities have persisted over time. And so again, the structural inequalities around the social terms of health also influenced by some bias and some discrimination, um, as well as these pre-existing conditions and disparities really created this perfect storm of um, inequity and impact from the pandemic. And 
to further emphasize this, the impacts are not just a disease here and now. We know that there's long-term implications from neurological implications to respiratory implications that require rehabilitation, which is cost. Um, there's also a harder to quantify impact of what does this mean for the trust in the healthcare community? What does this mean for how people look at the healthcare community? And how do we begin answering these questions as we look forward to providing interventions there has to be a reckoning and understanding that um, these effects of COVID are long term. Um, and they really, again, bear the question of how do we want to look at this from a systemic way of change. Now, I have done the doom and gloom, um, and let's talk about solutions going forward. And the real ROI on looking at this health equity principles as improving healthcare overall, but also enhancing any kind of initiative any organization is looking at moving forward. So aside from the unethical nature of uh, health inequities, they're costly. They are costly to the system. They are costly to the economy. Um, 93 billion in excess medical costs per year was accounted. I believe this was a 2012 uh, number. And then 42 billion in lost productivity per year, as well as premature loss and premature deaths. So again, if we're looking at opportunities to improve value, improve quality of care, uh, reduce excess of care, health inequity, and really like looking at the opportunity to improve health inequities is, is a, a wonderful opportunity to really kind of put um, a stake in the ground to begin to make some change and reduce costs as well as an ethical imperative. The other thing in reality is, is that even though we are existing in a certain time now, as we look forward, statistically, minorities are not going to be minorities forever. Um, by 2050, 2060, some accounts, um, minorities will be majority populations. And that does not remove systemic barriers that have proliferated these communities. So the question is now is, as we look at quality initiatives and opportunities, how can we begin to think forward thinking to address some of these systemic barriers that have been faced by communities of color and other marginalized communities as they continue to, as they grow to be the majority. Um, and so as we look at these opportunities, it really is imperative to think through how can we, again, put health equity as the forefront of all of our quality initiatives, rather in the back end, um, to help improve the care um, and the ROI on any type of quality improvement initiative. So one of the things I also wanted to say, because I know that I'm at a digital conference, is that we're seeing this gap proliferate out in digital healthcare. Um, and so this is not something that is just in the box of uh, standard quality initiatives. As the digital world continues to be um, something in lockstep with more traditional healthcare metrics or measures or actions, um, it is occurring in the way that digital healthcare is also rolling out. So racial and ethnic minorities, particularly African Americans and Hispanic populations, are high adopters of digital healthcare, point blank period. Um, and they also are high adopters of smartphones, point blank period. But however, as these interventions have developed, there has been a gap in how cultural tailoring or cultural responsiveness has been addressed. For example, if you use certain carriers and you're relying on somebody to work with a smartphone, certain carriers do not carry certain languages and you have to get an external app to figure out what's going on. And as you can see, by not building those principles in, you're actually creating further gaps in the um, way that digital technology can reach these populations. And so as we think about the digital community and how it's really become one of the most important pieces, particularly through telehealth in this pandemic, it is incumbent to make sure that these kind of conversations are at the forefront and these communities and considerations of these communities are involved in the get-go. Now, one of the examples I'll share with you on this is that as I'm flaring my arms to talk, you'll notice that I don't have the smart uh, watch on or some type of digital monitoring. It's because it doesn't work on my skin. Um, and this is actually a real life consequence of um, not really thinking through these mechanisms in a full equity standpoint. Essentially, it builds down to the, the flashy thing that actually measures your impulses. They don't read on, on darker skin sets as well. So there's actually inaccurate data. And so as we think about how smartphone technology, how readers, how um, other type of wearable devices have become sort of lockstep in the way that people are 
uh, working to manage their care. If it's not developed in the forefront with those communities in mind, there's going to have potential clinical implications and it also furthers disparities. And so this is an example of if we think about the full community that you guys are looking to support and address through your respective organizations, again, it's important to think about these things on the forefront rather than the back end um, because it saves money and time, but also improves the effectiveness of these actual tools. So this is a just a quick, um, this is not my work, this is a piece from a, uh, a published piece just really talking about how to again thinking through um, integrating conversations about health equity and health disparities into the way that QI initiatives are addressed but really again marketing environment really refers to what is the environment they're working with who are you trying to attract who are you trying to influence what are you trying to improve understanding that community before you begin an initiative um, risk mitigation and compliance, again, is, is that opportunity to look at that piece and say, okay, how can we make sure that we build our system to have compliance with our population? How can we mitigate risks by not including these individuals in the beginning of pop in the conversation that you are in the future? The financial piece, again, looking at the ROI, what is that financial implication of not involving certain communities or not thinking about these communities in the beginning of the, in, in the implementation of the QI initiative? Um, how can we, again, really get the best return on the investment for the initiative? And that involves having health equity principles at the beginning of any type of initiative. Community reputation and marketing appeal. I would actually phrase this and say community engagement, but you have to engage your actors. You have to engage your communities. And again, not on the back end. I cannot tell you how many conversations I've been involved with with digital technology teams where they're looking to do some type of solution for a certain um, minority community. And the first question I'll ask is how many of those individuals helped you develop that product? And typically none. And then I shut the door <laughs> and I walk out because again, without that influence and that conversation, um, you're, you're relying on, on incomplete data to develop these solutions to support the communities you're trying to influence. And then again, the quality influence and the in-service delivery. How are you looking to develop that delivery, provide that service delivery to address those disparities that you know are, um, are being impacted by the community that you're serving? So I will conclude with a couple key takeaways. Um, and again, I thank you for this time and kind of suffering through the little blunder of the technology um, as we're doing this virtual conference. It's a business imperative. Health equity is not an add-on. It's not a cute little thing you wanna do for marketing pieces. It literally is a business imperative. As minority communities continue to grow, as they continue to expect um, culturally responsive care, equitable care, uh, reducing racism, you have to think about these health equity principles in the beginning, not an add-on, not in the middle, at the jump. Um, and it must be embedded through all QI processes. Um, if you're looking at your population, take a look at where the disparities lie along the spectrum and how can that be addressed through the intervention. When you develop solutions, diverse points of view must be involved, not just at the C-suite level, but community involvement. Make sure that you understand the communities that you're working with and working towards assisting and have their voice because again, having that solution would help reduce that issue of a, a, a reader not being able to pick something up on simply of just a, melanin, a melanation issue. Um, the, the multicultural healthcare is a great foundational tool. Um, and I really do encourage organizations to take a look at that distinction in order to begin setting that foundation but again, there are limits to it. And so you really have to think from a full scope standpoint, how do you want to address the systemic issues? Um, COVID-19 has been, you know, termed as shining a light these disparities, but they have existed and they'll continue to exist unless we all as organizations, as an industry can come together and agree that health equity needs to be put as a forefront and they'll continue to persist and create erosion of trust of the system. Um, and also impact the bottom line because the disparities will continue to grow. And then again, to improve healthcare systems, you must, you must improve health care equity. 
again, make sure that you're developing your solutions and your, um, uh, your, your solutions and your programs with a health equity focus in mind. Um, so again, I want to thank you guys for um, being present for this conversation. Again, apologize for the technical issues and I will open it up for Q&A. Danielle, thank you for that powerful, powerful and motivating uh, presentation. Unfortunately, partly because of the technical delay, we're right at time. So let me invite you, let me ask you a question in front of the audience and you know, we have the digital measurement community. I'm wondering if you would, we have great questions that were submitted. I wonder if we could take it offline and actually create a blog or a post within the digital measurement community so we can get some of the answers to your, the questions that were posed. Would that be okay? I'd love to, absolutely. Wonderful. So again, sign up for the digital measurement community so you can continue the conversation virtually with Danielle. Thank you so much, Danielle. Appreciate all your insights. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, we are now going to the concurrent work sessions. Uh, look forward to seeing you back here in the general session at 1.30 uh, for the paper killers discussion. Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy your breakout groups. Thank you.